All right, guys, welcome to the 54th episode of Below the Bar. In this episode, expect to find out what you should be doing to get in the shape of your life for the summer, how you can navigate sobriety without becoming a social recluse, and who our dream dinner guest would be. Let's get into it. Back in for a long anticipated, no one's anticipated it, <laughs> Q&A episode. <laughs> no one asked for it. No one are going to give you it. We are going to yeah. give it to you. We both put question boxes on our Instagram, anonymous this time. Haven't done that before. Have you done that before? Once? Maybe? Yeah, so I actually, I did it through the Brummie Brothers page, right. I think. We have, because we have done an anonymous Q&A. Yeah, okay, so we put another one, and there was no real holds barred. We didn't ask any kind of specific topic, so they are just random, realistically, and obviously they're anonymous. So if you did ask a question and you are, you are listening, hopefully it gets answered. And if it doesn't, just know it was probably a bit shit or, or weird. <laughs> oh, we because we we will cover this, but we did get quite a lot of weird. Well, not even questions. You got more weird. Wait, that's worrying, isn't it? Yeah. I've obviously like you've obviously I've curated quite a weird echo chamber, which yeah. is which is good. You encapsulated the the weird following quite well. It's good, it's good there because what I've what I've done is I've not gained anything for my business, but I have gained a lot of weirdos that I don't want. Yeah, maybe OnlyFans is your next side venture. Could be. Uh, well, someone asked, someone asked if eyeball, I was eyeball. going to start a topless gardening service, so there is good as there. equivalent, isn't it? Yeah, and really. the sad thing is, because I am that vacuous, if people would pay, I will do it. Yeah. You quite like gardening as well. I do like gardening. I mean, I'm jet- topless. <laughs> people will be fuming when I start the OnlyFans and it is actually just me gardening. <laughs> Tripod set up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mic'd up gardening service. Uh, yeah, so we both put separate kind of anonymous Q&As out, so we're going to go back and forth, aren't we? Yep. And I'm going to set a timer, so it's going to be it's going to be a time pressure situation. Uh, are we going to do a time per thing, or just for the whole? No, thing? I think okay. we'll set it to forty minutes, because otherwise we'll just it could go on. Okay, cool. So let's get get into it then. Right. So time, my first time <coughs> set. My first question was, are you judgmental? I don't know if you want to go me first. or you. Well, we'll we'll answer it. I think from both right. parties, I reckon. Uh, I don't think I do hold grudges or. Or judge people too heavily. I think some. There, there, it, it's, it's kind of it's kind of topical. It depends. Mm. It depends on the I, situation. I hold certain grudges. Yeah. Against certain individuals. Certain individuals. And I always will. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I would judge people. Again, well, I think we're all a little bit judgmental, aren't we? Mm. In in some ways, there's going to be certain acts that people perform that you don't agree with, and you're going to judge them for that. So I think. There, there's that, but I don't think I hold like a full blown grudge for any length of time. Um, no, I try and I th- just try and just let people fucking get on with it. I think you're far more forgiving than I am. <laughs> I think one of my one of my worst qualities is I am quite judgmental, and I've, I've had to train myself to be less judgmental. I think yeah. over over time. What have you done? I, just, to I, do don't, that? I think it's because I hold myself to very high standards, so I then get annoyed if other people don't hold themselves to the imaginary standards that I've set for them. I see, I see yeah. So you're living by this very <laughs> clear rule book that everyone else doesn't really know about. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, I have a very set like mental doctrine. Yeah. And then I'll get few I'm fuming when other people don't uphold don't, that. Don't uphold this imaginary doctrine that they don't know exists. Yeah. That's not not <laughs> ideal. <laughs> no. But, no one but, knows they're blamed by these, these rules. But the important thing is I have realised that and True. I am now trying to rectify the issue. Okay, cool. I like it. Well we'll have to check in as to how that's getting on. Um, but but then equally, like there there is always a time and a place for for aspersions to be cast. For judgments. So so, you know, certain individuals are just knobheads. Well yeah, and, and they you always will go be. through. And Could- instead of wasting kind of the energy and doing like constant mental gymnastics as to whether they are a good or bad person, you know. If they've done something, you know, that is unforgivable, just just cast them away. Cause yeah. It, it's it's very easy to then compartmentalise them in your brain, and you can free up energy for for more fulfilling pursuits. True. I think also it could be a little bit of a, a form of accountability, for not for them because you're not going to be you're not probably going to vocalise it, but for yourself to compare what they're doing to what you're doing, and maybe figure out whether. What you're doing is, is in any way <clears throat> close to what they what they are doing because if it's if it's something you see that you don't like and you mm. can see see that in yourself then it can often hold a mirror up, can't it? Yeah. Um, so I think that that could be an element of maybe where it can be 
advantageous. But I think there obviously you don't want to be judging everyone. Yeah, um, yeah. I was going to say like never judge a book by its cover. You've got to give people enough time to formulate a well-rounded opinion of them. Because everyone has like off days and off encounters. It's like you don't know what someone else is going through. You know, if you just have like well, that's it. The it, odd yeah. exchange with someone, but then, but then if if someone's in your life and they're repeatedly a knobhead. Repeat then, offenders. Then, then chances are they are just a knobhead. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> yeah, I think Jimmy Carr says it, doesn't he? He's like, if you're, you know, angry most of the time, then you're not a nice, you're just angry, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, and there's like, there's how, all, how are you most of the time is how, is how you are. Isn't it's it? always good to see the best in people and give people the benefit of the doubt, but then I think there is a skill in knowing when that needs to stop and you do just need to kind of, Put your energy into other things and other people. Yeah, I'm very bad at that because I, I do often see the best in people and have this rose tinted view of this person, and often that can mean you just get burnt or you end up getting seen off or getting walked all over or whatever. Because those people, if, if they have any malice in them, you won't see it because you're not <laughs> looking for it. It's that red car theory, isn't it? You look for something, you'll see it. But I, yeah. I'm looking for the good in people. So if there is any bad qualities, then. I'll probably will, I'll, I'll overlook them. Uh, I don't know where that comes from, but it's... it's yeah, it's, it does take a lot of emotional intelligence to get that balance right, I think. Yeah. You know, when, that, when they cross that threshold into actually... And then it moves into a different thing of actually having to then confront them. Yeah, well, that, no, different... that's a completely different thing, isn't it? It's actually, do I just distance myself from this person or do I think that they actually need to be confronted about their behaviour? That's, com- that's a completely different question. Yeah, well, we won't get into that because I'll, I'll ask myself questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, right, okay, so that, we'll move on to our second one. Spent five minutes on that. That's good. <laughs> right, okay, uh, dinner party guests, brackets four. Oh, this but is going to take ages. Caveat is Nigel Farage is sat next to you chewing your ear off about immigration. So there's one wasted seat. There's one. One wasted seat already. I know someone who'd like that. Um, yeah, that was that's just the dream dinner party. Yeah, just, but it's, it's, but it's, not a din- it's not a dinner party, it's a date. <laughs> Are you going to try and bag him off at the end of it? Uh, yeah, so I I said there's a there's a radio host called James O'Brien on LBC who's actually had Nigel Farage on before and torn him a new one. So I think having him as one of the guests sat opposite would be fantastic just for entertainment purposes because you can then just leave them to fucking hash it out and leave them sort of 20, 25 minutes. And all of a sudden, Nigel Farage has gone back into himself because he realises he's probably wrong on most things. Well, I mean, hopefully he will have left at that point. Yeah, that's my he hope. He will have had his trousers down, he would have had the starter, and then he would have made his excuses and left. Well, this he is can... the hope. So now then you can enjoy the three that yeah. we'll now hope begins. But so who are the other two? So you've got James O'Brien. I know, so... <sighs> Always th- can it be dead or alive? Yeah. Not as in not Bon Jovi. Like, can they be dead or alive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what about the guy who created the SAS? David, David, Sterling. David Sterling. Okay, yeah. Because from what I understand, he was very eccentric. Yeah. Uh, and let's be honest, he must have some fucking mental stories. Yeah, that'd be interesting. How do you balance him out with, with anyone else? Then? Well, I mean, realistically, everyone else is going to be pretty inferior to him. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, he's a, he's a war hero <laughs> and he created the SAS. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> sure, sure to being a god. Mate, I, I reckon... What about, there's a lot of, so we've got like an inter, the intellectual side is covered with James O'Brien. You need a we, comedian. Got, yeah, I was just about to say, you do need a comedian, because then we've got like the, the life experience of David Sterling. Yeah. We need some humour there, because yeah. otherwise it could get a bit existential. I think it? you want a comedian that's like, good at just, you can tell he's just a funny individual. You know, some, some of them, like, I think, Jimmy Carr's probably a little bit serious on the, on the, in, in the kind of normal life. But when he's obviously on stage, he's prepared and all that sort of stuff. I think someone like Shane Gillis would be yeah, fucking hilarious. He's just a bit. Yeah, he's you need just an idiot. Because <laughs> like, there's there's very different types of comics, isn't there? there are, there's kind of like more orchestrated comedy, which is a bit like Jimmy Carr, mm. where there's there's the formula. You can tell there's an act going on. Yeah, it's like he's doing like he's created like a formula yeah, where yeah. there's like a clear setup and then a punchline, and then there are other comedians who literally just get on stage. And tell and stories. Talk. Tell stories about their life. Yeah, like and Theo Vaughan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 And that, ridiculous. So you need you need the second type of comedian, I think. At a, at a dinner party, especially if you've got Nigel Farage there, because that's just endless t- <laughs> endless content for them. It's yeah. Endless material. So you, you know, Shane Gillis just calling him out all the time. Yeah, Shane. That'd Gillis. be great. He's yeah. at like his peak at the minute as well, so he'll have some fucking mental stories. Yeah, as well. he's 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 really good. Um, that's a really weird mix. That's a great. Like. That's a great dinner party. So we've nailed James that. O'Brien. Nigel Farage, <laughs> fucking 
David Sterling. <laughs> David Sterling and <laughs> Shane, Shane Gillis. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. No women. Hashtag me too. Yeah, well, Nigel Farage have a word to say about that. Well, the, yeah, so the thing is, like, because we've been forced, because Nigel Farage has been forced upon us, we can't actually invite any women because he is a misogynist. <laughs> so, like, um, uh, uh, we'd, we'd be seeing um, them. Off. Unfortunately, a hand has been forced yeah. there. I mean, that's definitely the reason. Um, <laughs> I think we nailed that. That's, that's pretty, pretty, pretty good, actually. Pretty yeah, good. I'm happy with that. There's a good balance there. It's, again, it's like, it's like England, isn't it? It's like, you don't just pick the best players, you pick the best players for the system. Exactly, yeah. And we've done that. Yeah, because we've only got four. Because so we, we could have just picked... named like the, the four most impressive people of history. And well, it that wouldn't have probably made a better, very good conversation. Wouldn't have worked. We've so got like... the balance right in terms of the intellectual, the politics, the comedy, the stories. People always say Jesus, don't they? With That's the dinner bo- he's, bo- he's, he's not even real. boring cunt, isn't he? Yeah, and he didn't even exist. Yeah, he wrote a shit book. Imagine writing, <laughs> imagine creating a fictional person who was boring. Yeah. You've literally got a blank slate there and you've still managed to make them fucking a shit point. There are people who weren't like made up who are now more interesting than, <laughs> than Jesus. Yeah. Like real people. Yeah. Who just made themselves so more You can all be a martyr. You yeah. know what I mean? That just means that you fucking browned out. Yeah. Basically. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll do two on the bounce now because it's one's, got, we're a quarter of our way into the time and we've done two questions last week. One's, uh, one's very quickly. Last person you texted was... Here we go. In- <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, good that. Real insight there into the mind and life of Harry Shepard. Yeah, so that was... Last on- person you texted is the person you sat next to on the sofa. <laughs> yeah. So last person, and then I'll um, I'll go... I'll try and... We're going to keep these non-military related, by the way, because we're going to do a separate one that is military related yes because um, we always get in, in well you always get inundated with the military style military style questions so we may as well save that for a separate episode and then we can just signpost people to that exactly so this next one says love the podcast lad big fan what ratio of strength to conditioning sessions per week would you recommend if my current goal is fat loss I have Ooh. capacity and train and schedule to train twice a day oh I'm glad he's given us his goal because people normally just say what's the best balance and it's fucking yeah completely subjective isn't it uh so we jump in well i mean fat loss is still pretty vague isn't it yeah so i mean well it's, again fat loss needs to be dietary first of all so you need to be controlling for what you consume yeah because if you're going to burn 100 calories versus you know not eat 100 calories it's just much easier not to eat them uh, yeah so like nut- nutrition really should be a bigger a bigger should, bigger component like than... yes exercise will help it will feature at some point but like the type of exercise you're doing isn't is, too important isn't too important compared to actually what you're putting into your body no if the only if the only sole goal is fat loss then we need to just look at creating that energy deficit however you want to do that uh with calorie restriction or keto or whatever you want to do uh then you can do that and then from a training perspective you want to probably set a separate goal yeah, to, that, hold, to hold you accountable to the training. Yeah, that keep, keeps you kind of excited about that training process, whether that's kind of a high rocks or a fucking certain 10K time, whatever. And then you can reverse engineer that to get your training process for the week. In terms of how do you structure kind of sessions, I would probably say you want to weight things more in the direction of weight training than, mm-hmm. than conditioning because that's going to drive composition. So when people say they want to lose fat, they don't really. They want to fucking be. They want to look better. Yeah. <laughs> that's what, that's what yeah. I'm actually saying. If you if you kind of w- look through it, so in order to look better, you need more muscle, less fat. So again, we need to weight probably seventy percent weight and thirty percent conditioning. So you know, if you're going to do two sessions a day, maybe on on two days you do two sessions. One of them's a conditioning day, mm. and one of them's a um, a weight training. And then for the rest of the week, you just focus on weights. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's like you should awesome. always do conditioning to some extent because, like, your heart is a muscle. You yeah. do need to train it, regard, regardless gonna... of your goal. Like, yeah, everyone that... needs to be doing conditioning in in some regard. But I think you know, by the sounds of it, I imagine like your goal is fat loss, but equally, you do also want to build a bit of muscle. Yeah. So then you should be weight training. And even so, when you're if you don't want to build muscle necessarily, when you're in a deficit, you need to challenge the muscles to make sure you're not losing muscle. Yeah. So. Sometimes if you just if you were to just run and create a calorie deficit, you would look shit. 
Yeah, well, you, you know? just you, you just atrophy. You look like fucking Schmuel from you the boy in the striped exactly, pajamas, yeah. and no one wants to, no one no one wants to look like Schmuel, do they? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, in short, you know, sort your nutrition out. Make sure you get high protein, all that sort of good stuff. And in terms of training, either set a goal, or if you're not going to set a goal, make sure seventy to eighty percent of your sessions across a week are good balance, like strength training sessions, and then have a conditioning sort of couple of days in there as well and whatever the conditioning is it doesn't really matter yeah I mean not um, fucking stream the garden if you enjoy yeah. that <laughs> stream somewhere else stream somewhere else yeah <laughs> uh, yeah so that, that's how I'd answer that one yeah that's comprehensively nipped right this is again this is this kind of encap- encapsulates this weird audience that I've managed to curate mm. can we appreciate Eddie for a moment my secret crush right we need to really because right, ultimately right that's not Dua Lipa, is it? Who's written that? Might be. I mean, it's not. Because no. I do I do check my story views. So... <laughs> she not in there? Yeah. No. No. Not, not yet. yet. Not yet. Despite all the mail I send it. Yeah. Mad that. Because uh, I thought you, you targeted her quite well. Realistically, I think the person who's written that is... He's a bloke, isn't it? Is potentially a middle-aged homosexual man. And objectively, there's nothing wrong with that. Not but, quite your type, but, I think. But... From my perspective, I'd rather it wasn't that demographic. Yeah. I mean, it's a nice sentiment. It is a nice sentiment. And I do appreciate it if you're listening. I do. I do they yeah. are, but... They, yeah, they definitely are. I mean, they get <laughs> live in the bushes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, again, I do appreciate it, but, uh, you know, we may have to pay the £7 a month to see who that was. I didn't know that was a thing. But he's now, is it a is thing. now tempting now that you've... Uh, yeah. Because, uh, I mean, do I want to know? Probably, uh, not. probably not. Probably better off leaving that as a leaving maybe do a leap. It could be. Yeah, on a mm. burner account or something. <laughs> yeah, no profile of that. Yeah. That's how she spends her free time. She's not writing music or performing. She's creating burner accounts. Masquerading as a, a kind of a weird middle-aged man <laughs> on the internet to bother me. Yeah, sending flame emojis every every couple of days. Yeah, yeah so uh, this I'll, is, again, a, a window into Eddie's Newly curate, curated audience. Yeah, I'll oh, we'll skip over that. Right, this is a proper question. What are the social challenges or pressures you face now that you've quit drinking and how do you deal with it, given how hanging out at the pub with your mates or nights out are all centred around drinking? Well, you, I'm sure you, you can take that one. I, I haven't fully stopped drinking. I'll, I'll come in on it in a second. Uh, so, like, honestly, I mean, this is obviously going to vary depending on... How you spend your time. How you spend your time, your Socially. social circle, and I guess how much you care about what other people think. So I'm quite, well, I don't know if you say it's fortunate, but I've curated a life where a lot of my social circle don't drink much or have quit drinking altogether so that I don't really feel that social pressure to go to the pub that I probably used to when I was a bit younger. And... uh and I also really don't give that much of a shit about what people think about me anymore, which I think is a symptom of putting so much of my life out on the internet. I think you have to kind of... You have to give away You have that, to give you? away with that because otherwise you'd just be like an anxious wreck all the time. Yeah, I think also you try and see people who maybe do drink outside of the pub environment. So yeah. if you're going to see someone who conventionally you would have gone out with, you probably go, okay, can we go for a meal or whatever, when you can then not be forced to be just stood there awkwardly with a pint of Coke. Yeah, so like for me, it really isn't like much of a challenge now, to be honest. No, I know for, it's, I get it's completely subjective, but kind of the lifestyle that I've created for myself is it's just as easy not to drink as it is to drink. Whereas a pre, I assume that the person that wrote this is probably a bit younger when you're of that age where it's very it's routine to go out, you know, at a weekend and see your mates and kind of like but trying to break that is really hard as well. If like ninety nine percent of your social circle he's going to do that on a weekend. It's like, well, you'd probably just feel a bit lonely doing... I think you have to either get comfortable doing stuff on your own, first of all, so then you, then you can, again, say it's Saturday morning, you're going to go and do something like a 10K run or whatever, yeah. whatever you can do that, that is going to be made better by being sober. Then you can do that on your own. You don't need your social circle to go with you or try and rally the troops a little bit and get someone to go with you and get some, maybe get someone bought into that idea of being sober or drinking less. Uh, then you can go, look, if you want to go and fucking climb Snowden on Sunday morning, probably that's going to result in you not drinking on Saturday night or potentially still going to the pub, but having that thing in the back of your mind going, okay, I'm not going to drink because I've got to get up early in the morning. So create something that you're excited about Yeah. in the times you would usually be wallowing on a hangover. And then 
ideally that trumps the idea of going out. And it's, it's, it's not going to be easy in the first sort of instance, is it? Yeah, I mean, I second what you just said. I think it's a, a lot of a lot of life becomes easier if you're comfortable doing shit on your own. Yeah. So I think regardless of the drinking, that's worthwhile to pursue if at the moment you aren't. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people are, to be honest. No, so I think that's like a good life skill to, <laughs> to develop anyway, aside from the drinking. Secondly, I think, like what you said, I think you should try and target certain individuals within your social group who you feel could potentially be teased away from the pub, mm. should we say, and you could kind of engage them with like a hike or a run or like going for food. Like it doesn't have to be like centred around exercise. Like No, but I think it's good if it is because, again, that probably does lean you away from yeah, wanting it's... to be hungover for that activity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So if it's something that's going to be a little bit physically, you know, in, physically uh, tiring, then you probably want to be fresh for it. I guess it's like it's quite cathartic. I guess like for a lot of people, drinking is quite cathartic and a bit of an escape. And exercise can fill can fill that void, that. can't it? It can, but it probably doesn't do it in the same way. No, it's different, but it's kind of like you have to adjust, don't you? A lot of people use drinking as a, like a pressure valve as well. Yeah, and, and exercise can fill that exactly. just in in a slightly different way. And the final thing that I'll say, just to add to that, is that this the the, the pressure you have to kind of like feel the need to drink and go to the pub is probably very circumstantial with your age. Because I think as you get older, you know, depending on the type of people that you hang out with, that will decrease. It is massively dependent though, yeah. It is massively dependent on who your social circle is. But normally as people get older, they get responsibilities and, and ultimately you just can't dedicate that amount of time to write in your entire weekend off because you're on the piss. And also, like, like it becomes a bigger time sink. Yeah, As, yeah. as in, when you, get hung, when you get hung over now, it's worse than it was when you were 18. So, drinking now comes at a larger cost. Mm. So, and it's, it's hard because we say this, don't we? Like, I think there is a time and a place when you're younger to get that out of your system. 100%. Because like, we're at a point now where... You know, like, well, I'm not drinking at the minute, but I imagine I will do at some point in the future. Not drinking much, to be honest. But we don't drink much, and we save it for special occasions, and that's good. Yeah. Like, I'm happy with that kind of, like, relationship, relationship with, with alcohol. Because, for, you know, for lack of a better term, we did get on it quite a bit when we were younger, and we kind of exercised it out of our system. Yeah, I don't think you can go through your, like, 18 to 22-year-old years and not pull the pin a little bit. That's, that's what I worry about, like, a lot of, like, 18-year-old lads now that go, like... Full mode, mode, yeah. mode. Cause it's like that'll come, that'll come round at some point. Th- that's what I mean. Like you're just 100%. kicking the can down the road. It's actually better to get it out your system. Obviously, like within reason. Don't be a fucking reprobate. Com- don't when, be a reprobate. But like when it's socially acceptable, when it's kind of you know. Yeah, don't say no to your mates who are all at the pub. You know, because you feel like you're gonna kind of like get one up on them. Because <laughs> you've like watched too many like Andrew Tate TikToks or whatever. Like, yeah. go and socialise with your friends if you are of that age, and then. Because those those experiences and opportunities will dry up as you get a bit older, and then it could reach a point where you then ch- are chasing that because you didn't capitalise on it when you were younger. Yeah, so those experiences belong at that time in your life, don't they? So, you know, coming back at four a.m. in the morning, writing off your weekend, doing this and that when you have no responsibilities and you are yeah. younger, that belongs at kind of eighteen to twenty-three. If you take those experiences and want to do them when you're 43, <laughs> it's the wrong spot, wrong Does, time. That's isn't it? called the midlife crisis. Well, exactly. <laughs> and so you, again, we've all been in the in the club, right? When and you've seen someone who fundamentally doesn't belong. They're, they're on the, they're there on their own. They're 45 years old and they're pissed and it looks horrible. You get this weird yeah, visceral yeah, yeah, feeling, don't yeah, you? You're, yeah. Oh, that doesn't that just doesn't feel right. That and that's often I think what can happen when you don't exercise the demons in your kind of younger years and then you have to try and catch up. Also, it could potentially just be that individual has just continued on that cycle and never broken it. Yeah, so well, if, that's, depending yeah. on who this is asking, this could be, if you're 25, then maybe it is a little, a little bit of a time to so, yeah, so address we've, things. We've kind of, we've assumed, rightly or wrongly, that the person asking this is kind of like 18, you know, like early 20s, mm. that kind of time period. But potentially not, right? Yeah, equally they could be our age, it could be older, it could be middle-aged. Yeah, so again, again, it, it depends, it's context-specific in terms of if you're 
someone who maybe is, I'd probably say 25 plus is, is the maybe, is a good age to start, start thinking about it. it. And it doesn't mean you have to go all boring and not fucking enjoy your life. No. But it's just about like, it's about readdressing the balance. It's like, what do I actually want to kind of spend my time and energy doing? In my opinion as well, it's, it comes out like you enjoy your life more. Yeah, because you, you have, you feel less shit. You're better rested, 100%. and you can you can't you can, be present in the fucking things. Yeah, you do. as opposed to just feeling like rough as a dog's ass. And it, it's again, it's that overcoming that initial inertia of like the first probably couple of weeks or months when you when you maybe are at the pub and you feel a bit fucking out of place because you're not drinking. Just lean into it. Have you got non-alcoholic beer you can drink, or, or it's whatever? never it's never been easier to not drink now. Yeah, so because there's so many good zero alcohol options out there yeah to the extent now where you can fucking also disguise the fact that you're not drinking yeah so in the past to say. in the past you always we would always stick out like a sore thumb because like the bottle of non-alcoholic beer that you'd be drinking would be like a different color Bex blue and it wouldn't be recognizable because there was only like one and no one ever picked it yeah whereas now it's quite common you know if you go to a weatherspoons there are a few different options the marketing is basically the same as the alcoholic equivalent and they taste the same you can pretty much blend in, yeah. and so it it really is not 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 never been easy. I think it's uh it's something if you are of a a certain age or a certain level of priorities or a certain level of like kind of maturity, then just lean into it and, and accept that there's going to be a little bit of a phase of your kit, your mates going ah oh, come on like trying to get you to do it, and you're just going to have to get through that. I think that's that's all part of it. Yeah. So there you go. there's some tangible advice if you do want to get away from drinking. But equally, if you are a bit younger and you do end up kind of like going out and getting on the lash, don't beat yourself up about it. Yeah. Because yeah, there'll be a time in your life probably where those opportunities dry up and you'll be grateful you went out and did it when you could. Exactly. Yeah. So next one. Would you recommend a Hyrox Pro for your first Hyrox? And what is considered a good time for the race? So <laughs> for, the it lame, depends. For, the, for the layman... No. <laughs> Depends on your level, doesn't it? Uh, Hyrox Pro is obviously It's not actually difficult. that different. It's, it's, it, it's I mean, more it, difficult it, it, than the it open. Obviously, it is more difficult, but it's not, it's it's not, not as much impossible. as a, It's not as much of a step as kind of other sports and no, disciplines. No, no. It's, like, it's, it's a bit more. If, if you can, I would probably say, if you're a bit stronger and maybe less attuned to the running side of things, maybe you come from a strength background, mm. then yes, because... The major differences are heavier weights, and that's it. You know, you don't have to run any further. You don't have to ski any further or run any further. You have to lunge more and fucking carry more and do that. So if you're strong, then yeah, why not? Yeah, so like lean into, lean into your strength, yeah, quite literally. So. But uh, again, it's entirely subjective. Like if, you, if your training age is about like six months. six months and you don't really have a background in kind of running or strength training, you probably then want to go in entry level. You want to go in entry level equally, but if you're like already a professional athlete and you just want to crack a high rocks for a laugh, yeah, then probably do a pro. Yeah, exactly. And, and what is what is considered a good time? Again, super subjective. Yeah, it depends if you're doing like doubles or singles. As if well, you're doing singles pro, seventy minutes is probably good. Like yeah. really, good, really good. Elite is obviously around the sixty mark. Um, and then, like again, probably entry level is probably hour twenty to hour thirty, and not entry level, but like, you know what I mean, like a bit more beginner. Um, that's probably how I'd, I would go around. And then, that. like, what if you're doing kind of like the open, or like shave ten minutes off those? Or something? Yeah, probably. Yeah, uh, yeah, because again, like elite open cat category doubles, they do it in like low fifties. Yeah. yeah. So as a general rule of thumb, maybe like take. So eight, minutes, eight to ten minutes. Eight off. to ten minutes off those pro times. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right, moving on. Moving on. This is a, just had my first big night out in years. How detrimental would you say having one too many drinks is to your ability to perform in the gym? So similar to the question that we answered previously about drinking, this is more kind of like fitness focus, I guess. Yeah. So there's no getting away from the fact that it's going to hurt. Uh, it's not good for anything physical. You know, whether <laughs> there it be, are. No physiological benefits to drinking. No. Perhaps we need to preface yeah. that question. Whether it be sleep or kind of muscular contraction or time to fatigue or whatever, that all gets negatively ne negatively affected by alcohol. But is one session going to completely derail your training? No, not at all. No, exactly. Uh, so you have like to time it right. I think that's that's where it kind of comes from. You have to be smart smart around the the session, really. So 
if you're going to go out once on a Friday night, then try and make sure you haven't got a session plan on Saturday, first of all. <laughs> yeah. And then on the Friday, smash your hydration, smash your um, protein, and then you're probably good to go. Yeah. Like, you're in control, right? So if you know you're going to go out and drink, then do as much as you can in your power to mitigate kind of like the negative impact of that yeah. on your track. So like you said, be really well hydrated. Don't kind of have the hardest session of the week programmed in for the following day. Yeah. It's like box clever around it. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. it's like you can't just, again, it's like don't go full monk mode where there's kind of like no joy in your life. Like if, you pet, if your mates or your family are going out for like a special occasion or whatever, then don't lock yourself away in your room because you think you're going to get ahead of everyone else in society by like not being sociable. Yeah, there was an idea but I was like, talking about. Plan ahead for it. Well, 100%. Yeah, just plan around it. There's an idea of, I was talking about with some of my clients this week where there's like, with obviously the Euros and summer coming up, there's, there's obviously this, this question comes up, but there's kind of an optimization to enjoyment yeah. scale that we need to kind of strike the balance of. And if you optimize for absolutely everything, <laughs> your life would be shit. You'd be yeah. sleeping eight hours a day. You'd never fucking drink anything but water. You'd always hit exactly your protein. You'd never eat any fucking like good food. Like it would be, it'd be boring, wouldn't it? Yeah. So there's obviously a scale at which this you is... can still progress, but you don't have to fucking sacrifice absolutely everything. And that's where you want to be almost. You need, to, and against that probably eighty twenty rule really comes from. It's if you're hundred the... percent optimized. You can yeah. not, not be very fucking sustainable. But if you're 100% enjoyment, you're going to be sad. You're gonna, so it's that threshold, isn't it, of finding the happy medium for you where yeah. you can still kind of have that pressure valve and that enjoyment, but then you're still making progress. Yeah, so exactly. Like, so 80-20 so is, yeah, is, is a good kind of like ratio always, to aim for, yeah. I think. Yeah. But, but equally, like if you're just going out for on one occasion, don't think that it's going to completely kind of ruin all your ha hopes and aspirations in the gym because it's, yeah. it's just one night out. Yeah. If, you're going, if you're doing one night out every night of the week, then that's a different story. <laughs> I agree. Um, we'll do one of these. Okay. Um, this is kind of military related, but kind of not as well. So partner is a commando looking to go through SF selection. I'm feeling very anxious as he tends to shut everyone out when he goes through a selection process. Any advice? Um, uh, well, you're so you're, I got, you're in a better position to talk about this, so <laughs> I got you can two, take the lead. I got two questions about, well, from I guess spouses that are asking about advice for dealing with their, their, their geezer being away. I think she, she said she was anxious about the fact that he shuts everyone out. Typically, the, this must just might be how he kind of deals with things. First of all, it's a really it's a stressful thing he's gonna gonna have to go through. It's gonna be. He almost for, for kind of SF selection needs a like single point of focus, and that focus is going to be this selection process for a period of time. So it's going to be four weeks on hill. He, he's going to be pretty much just smothered by that process. There's no, there's going to be basically no energy or time for him to be calling you, for him to be, you know, showing you that all all all, it, all this sort of affection when he has a weekend off probably not going to want to like travel up and do all this sort of stuff he's going to have to optimize for this process mm. because it's very it's very intense obviously the um pass rates are through the floor like he's going to have to be super dialed in but it's a it's a period of time it's like a it's a six month thing right so it's in the grand scheme of things if you see see yourselves being together for ages it's not that long and the same is true for marines training if that's his his way of dealing with things and he has to shut shut off a little bit and just focus, then that's fine. But equally, I think you probably need to be there as a support system, if if and when he maybe needs it. Um, so if he's gonna come back and and be a little bit, um, I guess stressed about whatever. Hope ideally, if you can take everything off his plate that it needs to be, mm -hmm. so he can focus on this thing. I know it sounds a bit a bit selfish, but it, this is a a pursuit that is gonna require a little bit of probably teamwork from the both of you. So there's a, an example or an analogy. Matt Fraser, who's the fittest, fittest guy on, the, on, the, on earth or whatever from CrossFit, who won the CrossFit Games like five or six times. He was was this. He was The process was encapsulated his entire life. For the year or season of training, he wouldn't focus on anything else. He wouldn't get, have any other kind of distractions or anything like that. 
and his missus throughout the entire process was literally just a support system. So she mm. was probably taking care of all his fucking emotional needs, cooking all his food, doing all, like everything was taken care of by his missus. So everything apart from training was shifted off Matt Fraser's plate and taken care of by his missus. So I think there's a good analogy there. If like for this process, for this time, then maybe you just have to be, you have to take a little bit of a hit and hopefully then he gets a fucking good job and he can do the same for you at some point. I yeah, I mean, no, on. I think you covered most of it there. It's like, it is, it is intense by design. Mm. Like, I'd, I'd be worried if he was going through selection and, and also then had the time to put into kind of like, you know, like servicing. Yeah, yeah. Like a a full, their, fully fluid yeah, relationship. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, I guess it's like you said, you've got to, you've got to reframe it almost in terms of like, it's, this is deliberately going to be really draining and I just need to be there to support this person through the process, knowing that in the long term, this is for the best of us because it's what they want to be doing and it will make them happier. And then also like, it's, it's, it's an important job as well, right? Yeah. So like it's, it's draining, it's stressful because you're kind of are at the, the front line of the like, sharp end, especially the, you're at the training. sharp end of keeping like the country safe. So like, yeah. If you reframe it from that perspective, being like on the support network of someone doing something amazing, mm. rather than like woe is me, I'm not getting any fucking attention. Yeah, exactly. Then <laughs> like maybe I, mean? I know, but but again, it's like professional athletes, like you said with the example of Matt Fraser. Like these are inherently kind of selfish pursuits. Yeah, because they are so energy intensive. You have to put so much time and effort into being the best, whether it be you know the fittest person on the planet or the best soldier on the planet. Yeah, yeah. like. You don't get there from kind of like putting, you know, fifty percent in on yeah. Tuesday, forty percent in on Wednesday. It's like, balance, isn't it? Like trying to strike a balance, but also be the best is never works. This is why you get, you know, like your LeBron James, who's fucking just consistently training all the time. You never never has a day off. Obsessed with the process, but to be the best in anything, you're gonna have to take a little bit of a of a hit on other areas of your life. But again, it's temporary, isn't it? It's not like it's gonna, this is gonna be forever. It's just going to be one of those things. So I think advice-wise, kind of let him do what he needs to do. Let him handle it how he needs to handle it uh, and just be there for him when he needs it. Yeah. Begin. Solid. Right. Uh, when is Rex and Harry's engagement announcement? Again, we always get questions like this. Yeah, kind of like great. low underlying homophobia. Yeah. We're, not a, we're not about on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, we don't condone those, those sort of messages. Uh, uh, anyway. And if we did have an engagement, it would be a fucking great party and, and you wouldn't be invited. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, I might as well do two here. Do you ever wish you joined the military? Again, this is a repeat offender question. <laughs> yeah. It's because you spend so much time with me, though. It is, isn't it? It's yeah. just like, just because I've kind of like. By proxy. By proxy, I've now kind of immersed myself in kind of like the Chad Echo chamber. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, for better or for worse, people are always going to. I guess because a lot of people in that space either have served or kind of it is their kind of like desire or goal, yeah. goal to serve. So when presented with someone who has done neither of those things, it could it could come across as quite uh, confusing. But I mean, like, yeah, small parts of me do wish that I did and then other parts of me don't because I feel like, so like everything, certain aspects of it would be good. So obviously the social aspects of it, like the opportunity for travel, like a lot of the qualifications that I'm now pursuing if I'd have played my cards right in the military, I could have probably been paid to do them yeah. as opposed to now paying to do them yeah. myself. True. True. Equally, I think on balance, a lot of military lifestyle is not suited to my personality type at all. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's six or one half a dozen of the other really. Like Yeah, and you can't really half ass. Th- this military, is what I mean. You can't it's half not- of it, can you? So like, <laughs> it's one of those things where if you aren't suited personality wise to being told what to do all the time, being kind of at the bottom of a hierarchy of kind of authoritative nature, then it's probably not for you. And that, that is you a real have half of it. That is a real sticking point because that is probably one of the biggest misalignments with my personality. And type. it's how the military works. And it's how the military so it's like, yeah, I could have like, I don't know, learnt to skydive, whatever. Yeah. But that's a very small portion exactly. of people in the military and it might not have ever happened. Well it's like one whereas... percent of the, <laughs> the time spent as well. Whereas, like... whereas almost certainly I would have been at the bottom of a hierarchy and told repeatedly daily what to do. Exactly, yeah. So and you don't wouldn't, wouldn't and I, I don't like that. that. So, so there you go. So probably probably So not. on on balance, probably not really. 
Yeah, all the rest of mine pretty much are about the military, but um, did you want to leave those? Yeah, okay, so I've got two more that we yeah. can finish off with, and I think we're basically, I mean, I stopped the timer, but we're pretty much Damn. down anyway. Right, okay, so with you both being in the same business, do you ever feel competition between you both to secure clients? Good question, good and question. business related as well. It's like, yeah. it's like modern wisdom, this now. <laughs> we're, you know, we're diversifying, yeah, going like away it. from kind of like casual homophobia and, <laughs> and fitness related content to uh to business business talk uh yeah probably not is the answer i think because we serve in different niches effectively yeah well that's, uh, that's the answer isn't that's it? the kind of answer really so fundamentally there are enough fucking people in the world we were actually talking about <laughs> yeah uh, i was just about to say there are more than enough people out there who need fucking coaching 100 percent. yeah we were talking about the obesity thing before yeah. Um, so before we sort of came on air, there's there's a a realization that's happened kind of recently, I think, in the last year, where now the most mal- malnourished people in the world are not under undernourished; they're overnourished, as in they are o- obese. So like, there's there's like twice as many obese people than there are. Yeah. So, so malnutrition. A lot of people misunderstand what malnutrition means. It's mm. not. It's not that you're not getting. It's not that you're underfed, it's that your body's not getting the right balance of nutrients. Yeah. So that could go either way. So it could be that you're basically not eating enough or you're eating too much of the wrong thing. Which is so, obesity. Yeah, so for the first Poor time thing. in human history, a recent study showed that now more people are actually over-consuming the wrong foods. Than, than under-consuming food in yeah, general. Yeah, which is scary. Which is mental. So again, like there are more than enough people who fucking need the help. Yeah. Uh, you know, so... It's not like there's a scarcity. Everyone always says this with online coaching. Oh, you know, it's a saturated market, this and that. But fucking hell, there are more than enough fat people who need coaching. Or and, and also, the fitness space now, if you look at performance, is growing at such an exponential rate in terms of London Marathon sign-ups last year were Eight record. 800,000 or something for like 50,000 places. Yeah, yeah. So think of how many like potential clients that, kind of, that brings in. Um, so the, I don't think there's ever... A shortage, um, no. and obviously again, like I, my majority of my clients are military focused. Majority of Eds are kind of fat loss and yeah. Like you have such a lot. Like, like we both have niches, but I think yours is so like nailed on and specific to the line of work that you were in before this. That like it's just a very clear distinction. Like there's no real yeah. overlap. Yeah, like exactly. I'd like objectively, I probably could prepare people for the military, but. I'm not very well suited to do it, given kind of my past experiences and background. So leave it to someone who's better placed to do it. Yeah, exactly. There's always a gap. Like, if, like again, you could probably know the the thing, the requirements physically and all the rest of it, but there's a gap between that and having experience in it. I think. Yeah, it's um, like objectively, like you can know, because like we're all coaches, so we can kind of see a goal and reverse engineer yeah, yeah. it for clients. But it's like lived experience. You can only realistically coach from a place that you've been yourself similarly you've been overweight and lost it <laughs> yeah i, I haven't surely i used to be a fat cunt yeah and now i'm not so <laughs> so you know that process what that entails that kind of how your the texture of your mind in those kind of scenarios i don't really know that because i've always been kind of for want of a better word underweight so you know <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, the, opposite opposite the malnutrition <laughs> yeah, spectrum exactly, there you go uh so so really no is the answer and and it's a good question because from the outside looking in okay both coaching both kind of fitness etc yeah uh but i think from from our perspective not really but no good question so nice (laughs) fucking open-ended question to finish with what's your opinion on the state of the country right now fucked and whoever asked this clearly doesn't regularly listen to the Uh, podcast because we probably did just wants to poke the bear we basically answer this question every week yeah in a word fucked it is fucking horrendous really um I think a lot of people think that I'm kind of not patriotic because I lean typically more to the left and I'm very critical of the country. I'm actually the opposite. I feel very passionately yeah. about the UK and the dire state that we're in. So I feel the need to voice it because something needs to change. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just because I'm not a like a place. just because I'm not like a flag waving Nigel Farage sport. It doesn't mean I'm not patriotic. And yeah, there's not like I, a, a dictionary definition for patriotism that is. A photo of Nigel Farage. A lot of people think that, I think. I, yeah, I would argue that a lot of people that kind of have that view of patriotism actually aren't patriotic at all. They think they're being patriotic, but they've got a very kind of like narrow-minded... Well, it's their definition. Blink, blinkered it? view of patriotism that's kind of yeah. like... 
fits a very certain kind of like niche, but actually ignores a lot of other things you need to take on board when you kind of... Yeah, well, it depends what you mean by patriotism, isn't it? If you mean like wants the best for the country, then I think that you can unpack that and very quickly come to a conclusion. That, well, that's it, isn't it? It's like, so you want the best for your country. It's like, well, a lot of these people... Voted Brexit. Bro, it's, it's, again, it's like what know. we're saying about Nigel Farage. He's like, he calls himself a patriot, but actually, is there anyone that's done more damage to Britain in the post-war period yeah. than that individual? Yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. And it's Same like with the, Boris Johnson, really. He, he would call himself one as well. And Yeah, I said, oh, it's, yeah, actually, we'll, well, we'll save this, but I was, we'll say, yeah, I won't, I won't get into that because that opens a whole new can of worms. But uh, in, in short, if you want it in a word, fucked. It's not in a good place, is it? And, and it, it's, it's really quite, uh, it's quite annoying, really, because it's felt the most by probably people from like 18 to 30 years old. Yeah. Who, yeah. Aren't, who aren't in London. Who aren't in Because that's the other thing yeah. as well. That Again, Chris Williamson was talking about this and yes. it's becoming even yeah. more apparent is the UK now, we, I don't, we really don't feel how much the UK has fallen economically, socially, culturally in the world because we've been propped up by London, which yeah. through all of this has continued to grow. Sort of tech and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So he so, was saying, it's so, like, so London is now the sixth richest economy in the world. Well, the UK is, but yeah, actually it's London. But yeah, attached to a poor country. Like if we didn't have London in the UK, yeah. like we'd be way like the quality of. I think the average quality of life now for a middle class family in kind of like Poland or you know kind of like Central and Eastern European countries that joined the EU about twenty years ago has now actually caught up with and surpassed the UK. UK. And we've gone in the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah. The, I mean, if you, you only have to look at NH, the NHS, which is a wonderful idea, and it's a wonderful thing, but it's fucked, isn't it? It is, because like, it, it's fucking mental. Like, you can't get healthcare. You can't... Your waiting lists are as long as your arm. It's, it's no good. And, and that's one of the things we use as a, as a badge of honour of our country. And we're but, like, OK, like, we have free healthcare, this and that, but it's fucking doesn't work. But again, like, you... you you elect the wrong people with the wrong ideologies and they seek to, you know, kind of deliberately dismantle these things. Yeah. So it's like everyone labels David Cameron as, you know, being a centrist. He wasn't really, if you want to pack. He, he, he appears centrist compared to what followed him. Well, yeah, but it's if you actually, perspective, isn't it? If you unpack austerity, which was kind of his baby and his kind of like whole doctrine behind how to get the country into better shape, he basically thought that cutting public spending was going to solve Britain. But if you actually unpack that, what he's saying is the cause of the 2008 global financial crisis was that there were too many public libraries in Wolverhampton. Yeah. That's ba- so what yeah. he's doing is he's seeking he's tr- he's to, to make the already poor poorer and completely ignore all the fucking misdemeanours that are going the... on in Canary Wharf. All of his friends who mm. are making bank, who, let's be honest cause the global financial crisis, continue to benefit, and then the poorest people in society have to bear the brunt of it in kind of taxation and kind of like cuts to public services. Well, exactly. Um, and, and the thing is, this, that's, this that's is an cent- age... That's centrist, apparently. This is an age-old thing, though, isn't it, that we are encouraged to blame either... Well, immigrants, ma- mainly immigrants, Poor really. people. Immigrants yeah. and poor people for... Being lazy, quote unquote, stealing, not working, stealing what, jobs. Stealing jobs. <laughs> but actually, the the fucking issue really is the ba- the banker who took <laughs> yeah. fucking six million in bonuses and you know didn't actually do anything, or made or made the situation worse and still took the bonus or whatever. It and is, he's you now, know all those kinds of things. And he's now prime minister, Rishi yeah. Sunak. Yeah, there that's you go. good in it. Yeah, but so, I, I saw a great one actually the other day on, uh, and it was just like a random reel. I think it was Joe maybe mm. who were interviewing people about you know their thoughts on immigration. And this guy was just kind of like the, the stereotypical kind of like little Englander. Yeah. And he was like, he was like, yeah, you see, the problem is, right, you, these immigrants come over, right, and you can't get a job anymore, can you? I saw and, this. Yeah. Have you seen this? Yeah, yeah. And he's like, and they were like, oh, so what do you do? He's like, oh, we well, see, it's, it's difficult for me to get a job because uh, I've got a criminal record, haven't I? Yeah, uh, come out of prison two years, uh, yeah. assaulted someone. Assault, yeah, brilliant. 
So, That's not, so right, so it's not the immigrants' fault. It's your fault for punching someone in the face, you fucking cretin. Well, exactly, yeah. It, it's mental, and it takes some fucking accountability yeah, for yeah. your own and life. He, he was, Don't like, just point the finger <laughs> at someone who just doesn't look like you because you're an idiot. And I hate to say it, but he was fat. Yeah, I mean, which again is so it's like no accountability for yourself. It's just easy to blame someone. No work ethic. Yeah, it's it's, it's just easy to blame a kind of faceless enemy that you never come into contact with because it masks over all of your insufficiencies. Yeah, well, exactly that. And and there are a lot of those circling around. And this is the issue though with social media, isn't it? That you're always going to see the most abhorrent <laughs> example. You're probably not going to see the balanced interview, are you? You're yeah. always going to see the geezer who fucking that was, is, is just an was, absolute fool. Yeah, you know? that was but, so funny though, because like you actually saw live on camera the penny drop. Yeah, that yeah. He, oh, that he was at, he's, he's like, oh shit, I'm actually a helmet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he went through his own little flow diagram. Yeah, so you could see the thought architecture, like those, the dust was being blown off the cogs. Yeah, because they hadn't turned for a while. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Since prison. Uh, but yeah, so... Again, in a word, fucked. But I, I don't know. There's not really. I, I could always, I always ruminate and think about where I want to reside. You know, yeah. as you, as you, as you well know, Ed. But um, and you know, there's a few, a few places that kind of catch my eye in terms <laughs> we, of in terms of English speaking, because that's just easier. Um, Rory, Sutherland, I don't know if you saw it. Rory Sutherland did a great clip on why it's difficult for native English speakers to get on board with learning a different language. Why? Because it's just the most, u they already know the most useful language. Yeah, yeah. So it's like anything Your beyond face. that would have to basically be a passion project. You wouldn't do it for practical reasons. Yeah, yeah, you're effectively putting time and effort into something that is... Subpar. It's almost like diminishing returns. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it is diminishing as well because the, by the probably by the day, more people speak English. Well, that, that's what I mean. So it's like, why would you put kind of like five years into learning decent Dutch? when you can only speak that language in the Netherlands and like remote parts of kind of like Indonesia. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. So, and like a really tiny colony in South Africa. Yeah, so I mean, again, you look at um, English speaking countries that you could potentially move to, you've got Canada, you've got America, you've got Australia, New Zealand. A lot of those places aren't doing much better. I mean, America is the fucking land of the play if you've got loads of money. Um, <laughs> it's like the land of the free brackets or asterisks not free yeah, yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> if you've got a shitload of money you can have a fantastic time in America taxes are lower you know all the rest of it and, and there is there are really really good things and people are, people who watch the podcast regularly know my thoughts on America I quite like it but Australia it's still it's housing market's a little bit fucked like rents are through the roof so much of the much of the same problems we have are I've felt kind of everywhere but I think it's ours are more pronounced because we chose to leave. Well, we're in Ireland a, a, and, and we're a also... 500 million people strong trading block on our doorstep. Yeah, well, it wasn't smart, was it? <laughs> it wasn't. Yeah. But yeah, I know, like you said, like these problems aren't unique to the UK. They're felt across the Western world, really. Yeah. So it's a difficult. So one. there isn't really a right answer. I guess, I guess an analogy is a bit like the Titanic, isn't it? It's like, do you go down with the ship? Or it, or stay in the hope that you can save it, yeah. or do you jump on a life raft again, not knowing if you'll survive that? That's a very good analogy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think you would you would always jump on the life raft like, <laughs> in that scenario. Yeah, yeah. yeah you'd so hope maybe so. Maybe should jump on. But a life but, raft. but yeah. unfortunately, if you do ask Nigel Farage, an immigrant has taken your space on the life raft. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stop the boat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so hopefully that rounds that up. Um, I think that's a good. Good space good to end space on. That was a good, on. nice, varied Q and A. Was that yeah. wasn't just filled with people asking us if, if we're, we're gay or not. If we're, which again, objectively, there's nothing wrong with. But we're both heterosexual men, so like, you know, yeah. as much as you may want it to happen, unfortunately, it won't. So worrying that you know that's as much of a. Yeah, he's, he's worrying that most of my questions were actually that. I should probably take a long, hard look at the type of content that I am uploading. Yeah, especially to your only fans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, are we finishing on any segments, or is that that good? To no, work? that's it. Just a just a kind of like all-encompassing Q and A. Cool. All right. Well, I'm glad you I'm glad you enjoyed. Hope you enjoyed um, the, uh, the the Q and A again. We're going to do another one of these that's military focused for a lift in the lid episode soon, I and mean, we'll use the rest of the questions for that. Um, Anything else to add? That's it, I think. See you next week.